tonight so we can post it uh, for more parents to be able to access and guardians to access. So our goal is the camera is only staying here. Um, and if there's a question that you ask, we've asked that Rick will repeat that question. Um, so then that information gets shared as well. So I'd like to start by introducing myself. My name is Heidi Mahn. I'm the superintendent with Brainerd Public Schools. And we are just really grateful that you took time out of a busy schedule to be here tonight um, to be able to access the information that's going to be shared. We also would like to be able to introduce you to probably and have you see the faces of some of the names you see quite often um, from the school. So in the white shirt walking, that's Principal John, nice, nice stroll, Mr. Anderson. Principal John Anderson. Uh, in the back, we have Assistant Principal Derek Hendrickson, if you can wave. Um, I want to thank, we have Chief Jim Exted from our Baxter Police Department. So anytime we have um, anything happening, it's just been really great to have Jim with us. Uh, we have Randy Heitman, who just came here. So Randy Heitman from our school board. We have uh, Sarah Spear as well from our school board. So those are just some of our school people with us this evening. And I'm actually going to hand over the mic rather than just pointing um, at them as we have uh, oh. <laughs> Ooh, dangerous. Um, we also have our school counseling staff from Forsey Middle School, so I want you to be able to meet them and hear from them as well. That's good. Hello, everybody. I'm Megan Stanfield, and I'm the second grade school counselor this year. I'm Helena Wise. I'm the sixth grade school counselor. I'm Trudy Sorbakin, and this year I'm fifth grade. And then Ashley Rutman is our fourth school counselor. She's eighth grade this year, and she's at home with her children tonight. I'm Susan Rio, and I'm the counseling secretary here at Fourth Street. Yeah, so a lot of times we see these people's names and emails, so it's really important that you be able to connect that name to a face. So I'm really grateful that um, these individuals from our school are with us this evening. So I do encourage you once we're done to just connect with them and ask them any questions you might have. With that, it's a, a privilege and I'm very grateful. We've had a long-standing partnership in Brainerd Public Schools with Northern Pines Mental Health Center. As a matter of fact, we've had Northern Pines counselors in our school buildings for over 30 years. So we've had significant mental health support that's existed in our settings um, from pre-K all the way to the age 21. Uh, Rick Jackson with us this evening, he's from Mobile Crisis Outreach. And so again, when we have significant events and we look at the extra staff, um, that comes into our buildings. We've been very grateful for additional Northern Pines mental health counselors that come in. Mobile crisis outreach. Um, I see Pastor Erica, you want to wave in the back. So as well as our ministerial association, we have lots of pastors and youth leaders that also come into our buildings. Then as students, if they'd like to request or connect with that familiar face, they've been available to our students as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rick and wave you. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, so I'm Rick Jackson, I'm a mental health professional with Northern Pines, Director of Mobile Crisis Outreach, and later on I'll describe a little bit about what our service does. Uh, but I want to thank all the other parents that came here and it shows that you're dedicated to helping your kids. And kids, thanks for coming, although your parents probably made you, that's okay. Uh, you're here and that's what's important. So, uh, Three of the main topics that I want to talk about tonight are mental health stigma, and kind of what we can do about that and how it prevents us from sometimes from getting the help that we need. Um, how to know when more help is needed when we have children, sometimes the problems mental health wise happen, just like with medical things where we need to talk to other people that have a specialty um, are able to help us. And then how do we connect with those resources? Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about stigma first. Um, when a student comes in and they have a broken arm or they have a black eye, our first reaction is, you know, what happened? And we have empathy and we understand something happened and we feel for them and we're able to openly discuss that. It's not the same for mental health. I think it's getting better, but I think we have a long ways to go yet. Um, so how do we have these conversations in schools? How do we have these conversations at home? How can we have it so that we can talk to our kids about this stigma and about their mental health. How can we have open communication so that they're willing to chat with us about these things? Um, it, as a parent, we have a lot of hard conversations. I remember in school, the, the don't drink and drive, and they show you the, the wreck of the car when somebody did that, and you could, you could die, you could kill somebody else. And those conversations are important. And yet, 
again, when we talk about mental health, when we talk about suicide, and those type of things, people have a really hard time because it's uncomfortable. The more we talk about it, the more the stigma is going to go away. Um, and so, even if it's uncomfortable, um, I like to challenge parents to be able to have some of these open conversations with their kids, or if, if needed, with other kids as well. I know when my kids, they're, they're in college now, but when they were in middle school and high school, I had kids coming and going all of the time, especially if I had pizzas in the freezer and, and pop in the fridge. There was always kids coming and going, and I loved it. I really did. <clears throat> and I like to think I was a support for some of those kids, just like when my kids went to other homes, they had supportive parents there as well. And if we all work together, not just with our kids, but the kids that we know, we're that stronger of a community. So, if we don't talk about things enough, um, it, it's uncomfortable, and when it's uncomfortable, we don't bring it up. So, we're going to make it a little uncomfortable tonight. We're going to bring up some things that might be a little bit uncomfortable, but that's okay, because we're going to get through it, right? Um, so, COVID was really hard for a lot of people's mental health for a lot of different reasons. And not that mental health wasn't there before, but a lot of things are showing up in greater numbers right now. Um, for middle school and high school ages, 12 to 18. So 12 to 18, the second leading cause of death in the United States is suicide. If you look at ages 10 to 14, since 2006, the number of suicides have more than doubled. It is also the second leading cause of death for those ages. So this isn't to scare anybody any more than we talk about drunk driving, any more than we talk about cancer, that we talk about things that maybe we have a little bit of control over, but not as much as we wish. So we're not just going to talk about suicide, we're going to talk about overall, generally, how do we help our kids. Um, role model, I think that's one of the biggest things. A lot of parents struggle with talking about their own emotions even with their kids. <clears throat> my dad was a fantastic dad. I love my dad. He passed away over a year ago. He was a fantastic dad. And when he came home from work, never once, all the time I met him, did he not have a good day, according to him. Sometimes, oh, how was your day, dad? He kind of grit his teeth, really good. I could, I, could, I could tell as a kid it probably was not really good, but that was the end of the conversation. And so I had a learning, a lot of learning to do when I grew up of how do I express my emotions? And I know what my dad was doing. He was trying to protect me. If he's having a bad day, he didn't want to put that pressure on me or my brother. And I get that. Um, but inadvertently, what we do if we don't share is we don't give the kids the resources and the emotional stamina and the capability of working through those emotions and sharing. None of us can handle everything on our own. So number one, role modeling. When um, one of my sons, he must have been about seven or eight. And I took medication every night. I struggled with depression and anxiety most of my life. Well, what's that for, Dad? And I said, well, and when I would go through my depressive episodes, I would get really short. I would get really anxious. I would have more anger. And so I said, well, son, this is my anger pill. If I take this every day, I'm not as angry. He's like, okay. And so we're going down to see my dad, who's having a, a kidney removed because he had cancer. And we're down by the VA in the cities, and I'm behind this car. And I'm really a patient person, I really am most of the time, until I'm behind the wheel. <laughs> and then not so much sometimes, right? So you have to take a left turn, you wait for the green arrow, and the guy ahead of me, I don't know what he was doing, he didn't go. Beep a little bit. Green arrow happens again, and you have the trams next to there. So one is coming, so we could not turn. So it turns red again. And by now I'm like, hey, I want to see that. Surgery, all of this. And another train went by, this is a turn green, and um, I'm not proud to say I probably left some words loose that my, I wish my kids had not heard. But my, my son Brady's like, Dad? I'm like, yeah, I think you need some more of your anger pills or something. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, you might be right, sir. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure this out. So uh, what I tried to do is when I had a bad day, I would tell my kids. When I would get angry, I would tell my kids, I'm really frustrated about this. Here's how I'm going to handle it. So if we have a job interview and we don't get it, that's disappointing, right? That's human nature. It's okay to talk to your kids. You know, I went for this job. I was really hoping I got it. I thought it was going to be good, and I didn't. Man, I'm disappointed. Um, and here's what I'm going to do about it. You know, I'm treating myself tonight. We're going to order pizza 
we're going to you know, watch the TV, we're going to do whatever. Um, if we teach our kids that we have bad days sometimes, if we have depression, if we have anxiety, that's okay. We're not burdening them, we're teaching them that life is hard as much as we want. We can't protect our kids from everything. But what we can do is give them the tools to be able to do it and to let us know when they're struggling. I wrote myself some notes, which really is good when I follow it. Um, <laughs> another thing we can do is when we step in when the emotions are high. So, kids, and I don't know if you guys have any kids that, that do this, but when they get mad over small things, sometimes you can tell. They start stomping their feet and you ask them what's wrong, and of course, nothing is, nothing's wrong. Um, sometimes just noticing, naming the behaviors. Or I can tell you're, you're really frustrated, you're like pounding on the keyboard with your, with your fists. Why don't you take a break for a minute? So sometimes naming their behaviors lets them know, okay, I'm, I'm paying attention here, I know what's going on. Um, you're struggling, here's what you can do. They need that help. As adults, sometimes we need help. We need people to say, hey, you're, you're struggling. Let's, let's talk about what you can do. So the more that you talk to kids about these emotions and everything, the more they're going to talk to you. We never bring it up if we try to protect them from everything in the world. They're going to see all of these things in the world anyway. Um, let's help them get through it instead. Um, so when their, their emotions are going up, let's help them out. There's different levels of struggle. Some people need a little bit of help. Um, their favorite grandfather dies a couple months later. They're still struggling or they're sad all the time. Maybe they're having nightmares. Maybe they're really anxious. They won't go to bed without you. Uh, right there, there's resources available. Um, there's a ton of resources here at the school. They have an amazing group of counselors they really do here, which is fantastic to be able to help the kids. There's individual therapy. There's free therapy online. I can't remember the, the name of it, but there's a lot of resources out there. Sometimes we talk about there's not enough resources. Part, part of that is true. Part of it is people don't know what all the resources are. It's not even a fault, we just need to do a better job of getting it out there. So, kids are struggling more now than they did even a year ago. Mobile crisis, we do assessments on people when they're having a mental health crisis. The number of kids that we saw last year, compared to the year before, was about 30% higher. And I talked to other mobile crisis teams throughout the state. Every county has to have a mobile crisis team. <clears throat> and theirs was very similar. And then some research came out nationwide, and the number of kids that were going to emergency departments due to significant mental health issues, like they're thinking about suicide, those type of things, was significantly higher. And so that puts a strain on the system, and it tells us kids are struggling. And as a parent, that's really hard. Again, we want to protect our kids. We can't protect them from everything. What are we going to do when they struggle? So we talked about some ways to try to have them open up. What are some normal emotional things people go through? Sometimes we have kids that are 13 and they met the love of their life, right? And the next week, after, one week after they started dating, they break up and they're devastated. That's not unusual. Um, we can help them get through that. To us, it is, uh, it's a week, but to them, it's a, it's a big deal. And when we talk about mental health crisis, it's really up to the person of what that crisis is. Um, death happens. A group, their favorite grandfather dies, they have a friend pass away, they have their pet die, all of those things are tough. And there's a normal grieving cycle. And we're there to support them, and we're there to help them get through that. And when those events happen, you can share as well. When your mother or father passes away, telling them that you're sad, telling them it's really hard, and telling them also what you're going to do to take care of yourself is important. Your role model. You're giving them some of those tools. Now let's talk about if it's more <clears throat> than just outside the norm. It's more than just the normal grief process. What do we do if a kid, our kid comes to us, somebody else's kid comes to us, and they say, I don't, I don't want to be around anymore. I, I don't see the point of life. I, uh, I've had these thoughts for a while, you notice that they're sad, um, 
As a parent, that can be overwhelming and that can be scary. But the good thing is, we're going to talk tonight about how we handle that, and there are resources available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to help your kids, or to help you guys, or to help your friends, to help your family. There are resources out there. Every minute of the day, you'll be able to help. First of all, if they say that, there's no magic words. If you want the pain to go away, there's no magic words. I'm just going to make the pain right there go away. But if you can align with them, if you let them know, you know what, let's sit down and let's chat about this. And I don't know exactly what we're going to do right now, but we're going to figure this out. And I'm here. I'm going to help us figure this out. And we're going to get you the help that we need. And you're going to. Show that you care. You're going to have a lot of scary thoughts going through your head. And that's okay. We're going to talk about what you do. Um, some behaviors uh, to be concerned about. A lot of times you look on websites, when should I be concerned about my teenager? Well, if they're sleeping a lot, if they're really grumpy, um, if they have a hard day at school. What teenager isn't grumpy? There's some that I swear it's six weeks in a row and it's like, it's, you're still grumpy. Um, what teenager doesn't love to sleep till noon on a Saturday? Um, you have the wood chipper outside their window, it doesn't matter. It's, I'm tired. Well, you're up till four, yeah. So, they're going to have these behaviors. Don't look at that as an isolated thing. So you guys know your kids. You guys are the experts of your kids. What change? If they're normally only grumpy 20% of the time. I don't know if there's a kid that, that age that is only grumpy 20%, but let's say for, for argument's sake, there is. And now all of a sudden it's 60%. Every little thing that they're angry about, that could be a sign of depression. It could be a sign of something's off. Let's say they're not eating. Let's say they're eating all the time. Again, not one day. And teenage sons and the grocery bills. Oh my God! But let's say it, it changes, right? The sleep changes for like weeks at a time. Their grades are normally a straight A student, and now they're getting C's. They're getting D's. Those type of things. And those are all times that even if they haven't said anything up till then, we need to have a discussion with them. And it has to come from a caring place. Even if we're angry, I, I don't know. If there was a time where I my kid come and they had a bad deed and I was like, oh, okay, that's great. No, that's not good. But if it happens a while, maybe something's going on. And we can talk about that. So letting them know whatever happens. One, I'm there for you. I notice your grades are slipping. You're normally doing really well. You're tired all the time, grumpy. Your grades are slipping. Let's, let's chat about this, okay? And again, there's no magic words, but you've got to open that discussion. So let's go back. They say, yeah, I have been grumpy. This is affecting me, that's affecting me. And again, don't put it through our lens of how we would handle it, put it through their lens. If they say it's affecting them, it is. So what happens if they say, there's times I just wish I wasn't around anymore? Okay, have you, have you had thoughts of suicide? Those words, our team, we deal with those words every day as we're talking about much. it's not a big deal, but I know that's not the case for most people, right? Those words are tough. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's like we said, we're going to have to be uncomfortable sometimes. Um, we need to be blunt. Are you having thoughts of killing yourself? Are you having thoughts of suicide? Have you thought about doing something to harm yourself? We need to ask those questions. And you need to look them in the eye and be willing to take whatever they, they tell you. If they say yes, again, we're back to, you know what? We're going to get you some help. We're going to figure out what this is. And by the way, one thing I should have done too, I have Andrea Delzell, who is a fantastic person on my team back there, raise your hand, do a little dance, just wave your hand, okay. So, if anybody feels like they need to chat while I'm talking, please go talk with her. She's going to hand out some resources too. We have cards that have the 988 on there. Raise your hand if you know what 988 is. All right, quite a few. That's awesome. So 988 is the new 911, but for mental health, right? So, somebody's breaking into your place, they got it done, don't call 988, call 911. Don't, don't make someone, right? You're, if you're having a mental health crisis, call 988. It's quick, it's easy. It's the National Suicide Hotline. They have um, different offices. There's three in Minnesota. The nearest one is Grand Rapids. A few call from the local number here close to Grand Rapids. And what they'll do is they'll chat with you. And if you need somebody to come out, they're going to call mobile crisis. They're going to call my team. And here, here's what that looks like. <clears throat> somebody calls up and says, I have a 14-year-old, 
they've really been struggling, asked if they had thoughts of hurting themselves, they said yes, I have no idea what to do. This really tall guy named Rick came and told us one time, and, and I don't know, I forgot. That's okay. They're going to help you for what happens next. And what might happen is they may call us up and say, yeah, there's somebody in Brandon, their kid's really struggling, they're having a police officer hurt themselves. I'm going to give you a call, I'm going to give some information if we need to. And again, I don't care if it's 2 in the morning, 4 in the afternoon on Saturday, I don't care. Hey, can we come and can we just chat? Okay? So, you can always read the emergency department, you can call 911, we're, we're going mean, to figure it out. But you don't need to. We'll come right to your home at any point, and we're going to sit down, and we're going to talk about what's going on. And we're really used to talking about suicide, and people that want to hurt themselves, and those type of things. So, it's okay. We're going to help you through it. Sometimes it's just resources. Sometimes people just call because they're worried. Here's how my son's been behaving. It's unusual. When I try to talk to him, he just shuts down. He said, you're stupid mom, you're stupid dad. I don't want to talk to you. That's okay. We can talk you through what you can do. So the biggest thing that I want everybody to know is there's, there's always hope. And sometimes even if a kid or an adult is feeling hopeless, there's always hope. But sometimes we have to help them get to that spot. And there's resources to get you to that spot. You don't always know what I have to say. There's somebody out there. There's a local crisis line as well. And again, we've got those resources we will give you guys. I would challenge everybody to talk to their kids about mental health. Do it not just when they're doing bad, but when they're doing well. Sometimes that's when you can get it. You've noticed you've really been doing great the last three days. That's fantastic. I'm glad you're doing well. You know, last week you were, you were struggling a little bit. Is there anything that, what was going on? What do you think was happening? And sometimes as a teenager, I was kind of an angry teen. I wasn't real bad. I was angry a lot. And I didn't know why. Anything made me angry. Now it's just people that drive slow in the left lane. But the less talk with the kids, show them that you love them. If you notice other kids coming into your home and they're down and they're not normally down, that's okay. Let's support each other. Let's support everybody else's kids too. Hey, little Johnny, I know that you're, looks like you're struggling. But tell me what's going on. Maybe they open up, maybe they don't. But you've got, you got to give it a shot. We can't let being uncomfortable dictate not having these conversations with your kids, their friends, and our family. So what do you do when a kid says, I don't want to talk about it. Sometimes we've got to put a little pressure on them. A little bit. It's okay. Right? If, if you know there's significant things going on, let them know again. I support you. I support you no matter what. And sometimes kids, they, uh, <clears throat> they got in trouble for baking at school, and for them it's, it's, it's this huge deal. And they don't want to talk about it, even though inside they feel the guilt or more shame. And that's just one of the hundred things that happened that week. Um, letting them know. This, this isn't about getting in trouble. This is about really us helping you out. So, Kids deal with a lot these days. Um, Social media has had a huge impact on things. Back in my day, I got bullied. When I went home, it was over. But it's not over anymore. Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram. There's probably a bunch I'm missing because I'm too old to know. Um, the stress of the world. Uh, when stressful things happen, whether it's possible war, whether it's COVID, whether it's whatever, they're inundated with disinformation. So it's different. Um, but we can help them through it. And there's people, if you don't know how, there's people out there that can help you again, anytime. We get calls at 2 in the morning. I'm just I'm worried about this, I can't sleep, so this is going on. Right. Let's chat about that. But I want to hear from you guys. What are your guys' challenges? What are the things that, that scare you? Or any other questions? Yes? thoughts or, or whatever. How do you have that conversation with another parent? So I, I would say calling them on the phone or, or talking to them in person and say, hey, introduce yourself. Here, here's what's going on. I'm talking with your daughter. 
uh, Emma, and she's just really struggling. I want you to know, I know that you probably care a lot about her and things, and so it sounds like she needs some help, and sometimes it's tough to talk to parents. She talked to me, and you know, if there's anything I can do to help you out, that would be great, but I wanted to let you know. Okay? Yeah. Kids Helping Kids, by the way, is it's, that's phenomenal. We've got different um, organizations in the Brainerd area. We've got Smiles for Jake. We have a Lighthouse Project um, where kids are out there and they're working hard to help each other and to help connect with resources, to help prevent suicide. Um, those type of organizations are fantastic. One thing, too, um, when you're talking with your kids, sometimes kids like to go to other kids when they're struggling. That's normal developmentally that starts in kind of the middle school, right? Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been the uncool parent. I've been there. Uh, or they don't necessarily want you to pick them up right at the movie theater or go in with them and sit between them and their friends. Uh, and that's okay. I can handle that. Uh, but sometimes I tell them, I know you're struggling. I know you've got great friends, and I appreciate that. I'm so glad you guys are supporting each other. Sometimes, though, Another 14-year-old, well, they know exactly how to help you if you're struggling. For some things, maybe. How do you talk to that cute girl? Yeah, I go to them, I'm not going to help you. I don't know what to do. But if it's other stuff, if it's important stuff, if you're having these thoughts of hurting yourself, whatever, I really, I need to know about it. And we're just going to talk about it. It doesn't have to be a big deal. But I get concerned sometimes. Because, again, kids want to help. Kids have big hearts. I'm going to help all my friends. But what happens when their capacity is, is now too much? where they're helping all their friends and it's affecting them. And they don't want to let their friends down. I promise them until that parent. Yeah. Uh, what do you do when your child um, says all the right things, like, I'm not having these feelings, and, you know, they're, like, lying to you about how they're feeling? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know that it's probably not normal, but when they say all the right things to make you reassured that they're fine and they're not, I guess is my question. Yeah, so the question is, what do you do if you have a kid and you've asked them how they're doing and they're lying and they're, they're saying, I'm fine, but everything's fine. And yet you can kind of tell, you've got that mom radar, that special mom radar, that you can tell something's going on. Um, what comes to mind is a couple of things. One is asking them, let's say you were struggling, how would I know? What, how would I be able to tell? Maybe you're not comfortable talking to me. Is there another adult that you'd be able to tell? Oh, I really like the, the gym teacher or somebody. I was like, that's great. You've got, you've got another adult. I just want to let you know you don't have to do all this on your own. It's really hard. It's hard for adults, especially hard for kids. Um, but here's what I'm noticing. I'm noticing these behavior changes. You're acting different. And whatever it is, again, we can talk about it. And it's important to have these conversations often because you're going to make it awkward for the kid, which sometimes I enjoy actually kind of making it awkward for kids sometimes. Uh, the first couple times you talk to them, they might not say anything, but eventually they might. And that's why it's important to have those conversations when they're in a good mood as well, uh, to keep those conversations going when they're struggling. If we only bring up to talk about suicide one time, it's going to be kind of awkward. If we've talked about what we what would you do if you had thoughts of suicide? What would you do if you had thoughts of harming yourself? If we bring that up a few times, that eighth time when something's really going on, they're much more likely to talk about it. You don't have to talk about it every day. Every time of your day. But bringing it up once in a while, it's like we talked about other things with our kids. Drugs, alcohol, pregnancy, social media, whatever it is. That is hard. Kids aren't always open with their parents. What else you guys got? So when we were kids, depending on how old you are, there was dare, right? Like, we mm -hmm. came into schools, we talked about drugs, yep. all sorts of different education. What type of resources do the kids have to learn about what social media is going to be and what bullying is going to be? Like, what is happening nationwide? Is there anybody developing something for the kids to support each other and learn this, not in a reactive way, but more proactive. More proactive. And I'm wondering if Heidi Hahn would have a better answer than, than I would. I'm actually going to defer. Can I ask Trudy? I can say a few things as well. I, yeah, because I think, you know, knowing that there's a lot going on, um, yeah. especially with the social media, the digital citizenship, 
relationship, but I think about suicide prevention. Uh, I think about uh, the assembly today. So, John, I don't know if you guys on the spot, but. Yeah. And, and repeat it again. So, John, if you want to go to the, we're trying to repeat sure. the parents too, so you can yeah, there's repeat the question. Get in front of the camera. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> makes it all official. <laughs> Um, you mentioned a lot of topics, yeah. right? It's okay, so hot. social media, let's talk about that for a little bit, right? Yeah. If you all have Skylert, you've been getting your weekly emails that were connected to Common Sense Media. And they've all think, how, how do you monitor kids' use on their Chromebook? How do you look, know what kind of apps you How do you monitor YouTube? All kind of very specific things. So we, we went into this year with that goal embedded into our planning for this year, so when next year rolls around, in all of our rotation classes, multimedia classes, health class, we're gonna have a unit of common sense media and how to help our kids be better digitally smart and be good digital citizens. Um, we're still gonna continue to send out those weekly emails um, and with those links on there for parents so they can have resources um, so um, we've recognized that with, with the changes that we're seeing with mobile technology, uh, that we have to adapt to that and do more of our curriculum planning and, and education for kids for that. So starting next year, um, we thought, well, we've got to do this in phases. Let's get parents with some information. Let's get that process in place. And then starting next year, we'll have some things in place, five, eight, uh, for digital citizenship. Um, above and beyond all the other, other things too, is that our staff at Forest School, and a little shout out for our excellent folks, um, they embed a lot of things about decision making. Uh, fifth grade, just right after Christmas, got done with a, a decision making process uh, in their science classes. Um, yeah, uh, so embedded in almost all of our uh, subject areas, we do things about social emotional learning, decision making, what value lessons can we instill. As you, as you know, when we walk into the school, our mantra is uh, be respectful, be responsible to yourself. And so that's uh, embedded it into all we do. Um, for a number of years now, uh, we've also had um, our, our social emotional lessons. Uh, so we call it Fun Friday um, and two, if one to two Fridays a month, we will do a social emotional lesson, and those middle school kids love it. That's a joke. They kind of roll their eyes. We're going to talk about some, some things, uh, you know, about conflict resolution and handling our emotions and decision making with, with that. Um, but then we also then turn those Fridays into times that teachers and students can put away academics and just be with each other. Play games, talk, whatever you want to do in your advisory time or your fun Friday time is to have fun with each other and get to know each other because that's very important because we know a good healthy uh, ed uh, educational process, the foundation for all of that is positive relationships. And so um, that's some of, the, some of the focus that we have with that. Uh, we do have a process to take a look at uh, what, whether it be science curriculum or math curriculum, we do take a look at what is happening in society, what's the trend with mental health, and what programming for um, uh, preventative programming that we can put in place. Now that's all the educational component, and Trudy, you may want to come and talk a little bit about um, uh, our responsiveness to those things. Um, so, you know, uh, middle school, uh, as we all know, for the adults in here, um, it was not a walk in the park. Uh, for some of us, it was relatively easy. For some of us, it was significantly tough. Um, yours truly, I don't remember much about middle school, other than it was just kind of a 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. It was a three-year academic party, and I just had f fun with friends and that. But I also had friends that had a lot of you know, family issues, friend issues. Um, so we know that... Uh, that developmentally, think of all the crazy things that happen between fifth grade here and this side of the building and eighth grade. Uh, they are different human beings, wonderful, marvelous human beings, but they're different. Um, and uh, uh, 
we, we understand that. So if you take a look at some things with emotional concerns, uh, friendship concerns, mental health concerns, suicidal ideation, we have processes that our staff know about that really our counseling team has spearheaded and led. Uh, if a kid is worried about bullying or they're being picked on, we have processes for that. You know, we talk about that um, uh, a lot about with our Fun Fridays. Um, we'll do our weekly videos uh, from the principal about what to do. We review that periodically through the school year. That's really talked a lot about in, in our classrooms and our team areas. Uh, but there's, there's mechanisms for, for students to report that. They can come into the counseling office, we have some reporting slips, whether it's a conflict with a friend or I'm being bullied, um, or I just need to talk to someone. And we try to be very proactive about that, reaching out to kids and say, you got to give us a little bit so that we can help you. Um, we have a wonderful staff that have their ears wide open. And it, uh, it's almost daily that a teacher, will, or our, our counseling staff will get an email from a teacher, I noticed this, and you pull this kid in, or they'll come down. And the uh, third piece to that, we have a lot of active kids uh, that will come in and say, I'm concerned about this, or you know, I heard these two that were in a conflict with each other, or there might be a fight because they were yelling at each other on the bus or at the bus stop, and we know these things. They come in with that, and we work through that. So through the informal channels and the formal channels, um, it's not a perfect plan, as you know, because it's the middle school, and everything is not always black and white. There's a lot of gray in this world, and we just have the adults here to make sure that we navigate that. Probably more than you asked the question for, but yeah. Trudy, anything to follow up? Um, I will just add that a little bit in the realm of the counseling, I think that sometimes um, people kind of walk in with school counselor and their, their own experience or they think of a high school counselor and it's different. Um, I would just educate to say that as middle school counselors, we, um, it's a very heavy focus on social, emotional, mental health. That's what our role is. Um, as, as, as part of being school counselors, we, there's kind of layers of what we often do. We get into the classrooms and teach. We lead groups. We meet with students individually, work with teachers and you know other layers also. Um, I would say in the sense of prevention, this is just off the top of my head. I have the numbers um, in my office easily. But I would say maybe 10 years ago, say in fifth grade is often the year that as school counselors we really try to get in and do a bulk of our lessons. So we used to, we teach top 20, that's one of the curriculums we've used for a long time, it's fabulous. Um, I would say maybe 10, 12, I'd have to look, years ago we were teaching 14 lessons a school year, roughly, is that kind of what we talked about recently? Um, four years ago we were teaching one at best. Um, last year we taught more, we had a fourth counselor for the first time because of COVID money. Um, we taught more. I'm trying to, I have fifth grade this year, I've taught two, trying to get back in, but the last couple of weeks certainly haven't allowed me to do that. Um, what we talk about with that, even as school counselors, is part of being in the classroom is really, my, what I've always said is when I'm getting in front of kids in a classroom, I'm building rapport with them, every single kid in that grade, right? Because they're going to, I've always said, if a kid doesn't come talk to me because I'm a school counselor, they might, because, right, I'm a school counselor and something's happening. But, but what we really want is for kids to come talk to us because they know us and they feel safe with us and I'm gonna go see the store back in the slides or whoever it is. So that, what, what gets in the way of that? So what I would say is why has that changed over the years? Because we're working more in crisis mode. So the more students that, that we do have who are talking about high level concerns, um, then that has to be what we take care of in a day and that has to bump anything else. So. Um, we're trying to get back in the classrooms more and do some of that. We, um, we actually did 5th, 6th, 7th this year. We did a lesson in 7th grade. Um, but as we are working more in crisis mode because our students are in crisis, then that's what pulls us away from that. So I could talk about how we take care of kids in the realm of when a suicidal concern comes our way. Maybe at the end if people um, need to, would, would like to know that. But, I don't want to take over with Mike. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Another good question to ask the kids is if, if you had a friend that was really struggling, how would you handle that? 
leave it kind of open to begin with, and then just kind of expand from there and see what they say. Would they say, well, I would tell you, Mom, or would they say, oh, I would tell their parents, or, well, if they told me to keep it a secret, then I probably would. I mean, it opens the door for conversations. It gives us the opportunity to talk and, and teach and, and guide our, our young kiddos. Yes? They run groups uh, called the CTSS that provides like uh, group skills training and things like that. It's a what issue, right? So I was told they can't um, yeah. in the past. They can't have two therapists. They can have two therapists and skills, but they cannot do the kids. They can't do both. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe that's it. it was because the person we were calling about wasn't saying they were going to kill themselves, but they were some extremely troubled things in their home. So typically when it gets to mobile crisis, it comes one of a couple ways. It could be law enforcement calling us, it could be the local crisis line, which is a different entity right. than other times. Um, once, once it comes to us, the biggest thing that, that we look for, usually if it's a mental health crisis, we should be showing up. And if for whatever reason we're not, then I'm the director, I should know about that, and we've got to figure that out. The common reasons why we would not go out is, one, is safety issues. Um, and, you know, somebody's uh, cooking meth downstairs and stuff, we probably don't want to show up. Um, that's the biggest one, really, is, is the safety issue. Sometimes people get violent, but um, we can talk after if you want. I could hear your circumstance, see what happened, but we should be showing up. And again, there's no age. We've seen six-year-olds. We've seen people in their 90s. Um, you just want to mention that we changed to that we can show up with their Yeah, so one of the statues changed here this last year. So it used to be if somebody called up and said, my sister's really struggling. Um, you know, she's 25 or whatever, and they're like, okay, is, is your sister allow us to come out? And if they said, no, I don't want anybody coming, we couldn't go. The statutes change where we can now. So, for example, we've had people call us and my adult son is really struggling, and he says, I don't want to talk to anybody, we'll go out anyway, because we're going to support the family, even if the, the, the son refuses, the adult son refuses, or regular son, the kid, kiddo refuses to talk to us, we're going to be there to support the family, here's some things, we're going to guide you through this process of how to help. Now, what we have seen now, which is great, is the majority of the time, people that say, you know, screw you, we're not going to uh, talk to you. Once we're there and we start talking, they do talk to us. And so, our ability to help third parties type stuff has improved. One thing we can't do is if somebody calls up and they're from Texas and say, oh, my, my daughter, my adult daughter lives in Pine River, can you just show up to go talk to her? Well, we can't just show up at somebody's house if they don't know we'll come kind of deal. But as a grandma, uh, kudos to you, and if they're struggling with a crisis, they should show up. I actually had one caller that wanted us to come read a bedtime story of their kiddo. I had to decline that. Um, I, I like writing bedtime stories, but that's you know, not the best utilization of services. But if it's a crisis, we should be showing up. Ma'am, in the back, do you have something? I'm just wondering if you have, if you do have somebody who you're concerned about and struggling, is there anything that you can put in action at the home to try to reduce risk? 
Oh, excellent question. I'm glad that she's not a plant at all. <laughs> so whenever we see somebody, we do, we do safety planning with them. And some things we're going to individualize it to the person, but there's some things, no matter what, we're going to talk about to keep your home environment a little more safe. One of them is guns. I'm not anti-gun, but let's make sure guns are locked up and accessible to kids. Okay? Um, it means they should not have a combination to the safe. They should not have keys. They should not just be laying in a desk drawer somewhere. Um, and the other is medication. So guns are the most lethal way that people uh, attempt uh, suicide. And medications are the most common. And I'm not a pharmacist, so I always recommend to people, I don't care what it is, please, Get a little lock box, 20 bucks, Target, Walmart, and, you know, if somebody's on uh, antidepressant med, you know, keep two or three days out, that's fine. Everything, Tylenol, ibuprofen, cold medicine, whatever. Some things can be lethal doses um, that are over-the-counter stuff. And so that's best practice, really. Um, even grandparents. Do you have any kids coming in? Because, again, they bring friends over. Do you know what their state of mind is every time they come over? And so, an easy way to have your home a little bit safer, to mitigate risk a little bit, are those two things. Do you guys want to talk to kids if a suicide does occur for somebody they know? Whether well, it's a family member or a friend or, or whatever, that can be really hard as well. Um, for middle school ages, I would say the best way is um, kind of going back to the medical model of there's something that was going wrong in their brain. That's what the cause of depression and these things are. It's, it's a chemical imbalance in the brain and, um, and they took their life and, and it sucks and I wish they would have reached out because there are so many resources. So it's being honest in an age appropriate manner, right? It's the reality of the world that sometimes this occurs and it's very unfortunate. And I really wish they would have gotten help. We're not going to shame that person. We're not going to, um, we're not going to fault anybody for it. We're just going to say, I wish they had gotten help. And, uh, and it's really sad. And then asking them, how does, that, how does that affect you when somebody else dies? If they die by suicide, how does that affect you? What's that feel like you know, when that happens? Uncomfortable, absolutely. Important, absolutely. So, the more conversations you have, the less uncomfortable it is for everybody. If we won't talk about it as parents, and they're not going to talk about it as kids. Not to us. We're going to talk to their friends. But we want to talk to, to us, they want to counselors, the school administration. We want them to have adults driving that process and other kids. What else you guys got? Yes. How important is it uh, to keep kids off of social media? And any good tips on how you do it? <laughs> yeah, there's some cabins that have like no Wi-Fi or phone service or anything. I always wanted to bring them there. Yeah, social media is tough. Um, it's it's really tough, and sometimes it's, it's one of those things. Do I think kids should have no social media? Most of the time, no. It's one of those where if you do that, they're going to find a way. They're going to be at school, they're going to be on the bus, those type of things. Again, it's that, it's that communication. Here's some of the cool things about um, social media, guys. It's, you get to see pictures of your friends, you get to chat with them online. There's a lot of cool stuff. There's reasons why they do it. There's reasons why us adults sit in bed sometimes for an hour looking at TikTok and stuff. It'd be fun, right? Um, and there's times to say we need to put that away. There's a lot of negative things on social media, there's a lot of false information about the world and social media. And, and so if they're not doing well, it's time to look at it. what do we need to do about that? Even when they're doing well, what are the limits for that? Um, what some parents have done, for example, is, okay, you can have these apps on there, you can have Snapchat, these things, but I get to know the passwords, and at any point if I wanna um, look at your phone, I need you to just give that to me. And what that does is that builds trust to know that you're being safe out there that you're talking to healthy people out there. Um, and if you're not able to follow those rules, then, then we have to talk about what's really allowed on your phone or what isn't allowed. So I think social media is here to stay, whether we want it or not. And, um, 
what kind of influence, what kind of positive influence can we have on the kids that are connected to social media? You had mentioned parents laying in bed on TikTok. Um, in your opinion, adults, how much of the blame should we give to adults for the problems that our children are having in this day and age? Because it just seems like sometimes parents sometimes can be the worst enemy. Yeah, I think a lot of it goes back to that that role modeling. And it was interesting, me and some co-workers were talking today about how the world is different than when we grew up. So when I grew up, it was a long time ago. Fire had just started, the dinosaurs had just become extinct. We all learn to parent from our parents to a certain degree, right? We learn things that our parents do. So it, the way that my parents raised me was not in a digital world. It was a phone on the wall kind of thing. You didn't know who was calling, it was scary. So, how do I parent now when all of a sudden there's some social media? How am I just going to parent? I don't know what the world's going to look like in 15 years. And so I don't know if, if blame it is it, but part of it is I understand. Um, because we're trying to parent and things are changing so fast that what we learn for how to parent is different now. But even if you look at curriculum in schools, if you look at the best practices for suicide prevention, all of those things. So research takes time, sometimes years. So let's figure out what's going on right now, why all this stuff's happening. Okay, that research comes out three years from now. Here's the best practice. Three years from now, what's our world gonna look like? I don't know, but it's probably gonna be different, right? So that best practice might be better than what we had, but is it set for three years from now, five years from now? Probably not. I think one thing that we need to do, just from my own personal thought here, is that I think we need to teach our children why. I just know from my experience too how I was. Is if you told me not to do something, I'm going to go do it. <laughs> yeah, guaranteed you know? you're going to do it. Yeah. And I think, especially with the social media, my kids are way more savvy at 11 and 14 than I am. So what I've tried to do really hard with them is just develop, like, okay, if you lose my trust, it's very hard to get it back. But this is why I am doing this, and I talk to them about trafficking in the end. <laughs> You know, I mean, just all the uncomfortable I talk to them, they're friends about sex, but if you just talk to them and give them the tools, I think that that, that is very helpful for them, because they're going to find a way to do stuff. I found ways that we have to. Yeah, it, uh, I think that explaining why, which is what she's talking about, is extremely important. I'm an adult, and I get defiant sometimes if somebody tells me to do something or not do something. Yeah. I have no idea. Oh, okay, all this one, all right. <laughs> so, um, and the kids are the same way, we want to know why. And so it's okay to tell them why. Why are we making the decisions? And I get it, sometimes it's tough. You got three little red grass running around, and, and you're trying to well, get to say why. I'm just trying to have a little Johnny's not even toilet bowl cleaner, I don't know. So, but, but taking that time and, and having those conversations, yeah. I think one of the things that I've been thinking about as you are have been talking, this is all really good information. One of the things that I struggled with is trying to help my my kids' friends that do have, you can tell that they have a lot of uh, issues that are hard for them to get through. You know, they, they're going to have a lot of trauma. You know they have a lot of past trauma. Mm -hmm. Like, how to really help them. Because yeah. they don't have a lot of help in their home environment, which would go mm -hmm. back to the parent authority or whatever. But, you know, that yeah. I think is that's hard because if we can't instill hope in a lot of our children, we should put it people, but we can't control that either. Yeah. So, that part is the one that struggles for me, because I think it's a village, and it, it, it's very hard sometimes to be able to, you know, I want my kids to be friends with a lot of people, but yeah. at the same time, if it's a really, you know what I mean, like how I'm struggling with that a little bit, especially yeah. at 14 years of age. And yeah, so she's talking about the struggles when, when you have a kid, and they have kids from other homes that maybe don't have the greatest home environment, have a lot of trauma, those type of things. And whenever you have a lot of trauma and you have a lot of issues at home, so a lot of times that um, the kid is going to have behavioral issues, right? Uh, or upbringing is not as uh, safe and protected as, um, as other people. You're going to struggle more. Um, and I had struggled with that with some of my, my kids too. And, and, I, and then I realized I can be a positive influence on them, even if it's just once a week, once every other week. Um, and as some of the other kids were getting in trouble, I would, I'm not going to ever tell my kid you can't be friends with somebody unless it's extreme circumstances, but I'm going to tell them I'm so glad that you make such healthy decisions 
Um, I know a couple of your friends, they, they struggle, you know, with some things, so I'm, I'm glad that you're a good influence on them. I try to steer them and, and hope that they can be a good influence. Um, also knowing that they're kids, and I came from a really good home, and I was a good influence on some kids, and some kids were a bad influence on me, uh, but that's on me. So we do the best with that we can, we really do, and we've got to let the kids out into the world as well, so we know that there is no guarantees, and if we do the best we can, we've really got to be okay with that. Yes? Um, so this is more a question for the school, in a sense, but if you're saying that the percentage of students dealing with mental health is increasing so much every year, um, and there's only so many counselors in the school, and there's so many kids, how do you guys handle that pressure, and how do you guys handle having kids coming in and talking to the counselor, but you have 50, hundreds of other kids needing that help, and maybe a student comes in and sees the counselor, but they have to wait, like, do they have to wait like four months before they can see the counselor again? Like, how does that work? Who would like to take that one? You guys from the school are going to be better equipped to handle that. What's your answer? I know, I know, because I like it's kind of a multi-layered answer, maybe. Um, okay, brain's tired. Um, if a okay, um, our our staff in our building are very well trained that if they hear any kind of conversation of any type about I want to kill myself, I want to anything like that, they want to come to us. We train our staff really well. Um, when they come to us as school counselors, then any child who is talking about that kind of stuff is going to be taken care of before any other child. So they're going to be right at the top of what I'm doing at that moment in that day or any of us. Okay, so, um, so what I would say is in the realm of um, immediate crisis, this child is talking about being suicidal in any I mean, that conversation among middle schoolers can go from, right? Um, but we're going to talk to that child. Um, so we always do that. We always call home. It's part of, that's part of um, just the protocol we have in our building. As school counselors, we continue over the years to just critique our own system um, of how we take care of students. But so to answer that, if a student's in crisis, they're going to get to us. And they're going to get to us right away, especially if it's a suicidal concern, because we do not want them going home. You know, and there's times where um, the end of the day came and something came my way at the end of the day, or it came my way and you had three of whatever the day was, um, then we call the parent. There's times I've gotten phone calls at home from a teacher, a student just sent me this, not just me, and we call the parent. Okay, so we, so that's one of the layers. I would say in the realm of kids um, being able to see the school counselor, um, that just really varies with how much we're working in crisis mode. We have a really good system set up. Um, Helena is our youngest, um, but she helped us last year. We have Calendly, which um, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders are all set up where they can go onto the Google Classroom, our website, and they can make an appointment with us. So our kids have really easy access to making an appointment with us. My fifth graders, I didn't want to teach that to, to them right away at the beginning of the year because they're fifth graders. Um, and it's part of what I've been trying to get back into the classroom is to reteach them because they're ready now. Um, so they have access to us. What can happen though is a student can get on our calendar. I have another student or two or three, whatever the day is like in crisis, and I have to move that student. So I would say, um, does that answer? I can't, who, does that answer kind of how that works? Yeah, go ahead, Megan. Yep. If we're not able to get to it, then we have each other for that. Throwing them pines is amazing. If they work with throwing them pines already, we can put them all up there. We'll get in more of it too. Yeah, if it's a crisis situation and one of us is in the midst of a crisis, then someone else is going to bump a student who's not in crisis and take care of it. So those kids get to us more often. Um, it's sometimes, you know, just can be harder to get in depending on the crisis mode. If they're not, that makes sense. Sorry. Mumble words at that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stay up there. <laughs>
my husband's out. <laughs> my husband's a Nordic ski coach, and he's like, like, how late will you be waxing out in the ski? Waxing skis? People are waxing Nordic ski. They wax skis. Yes, go ahead. Well, and actually, maybe it's geared toward, towards the district anyway. Okay. Um, but the kids who aren't at that immediate right now crisis level. Yep. How do we prevent those kids that are getting to that point if we don't have enough? counselors in the school, because obviously everybody's doing the best that they can. Yeah. You're only one person for a, a whole grade. Yeah. And you can rely on each other, that's awesome. And good for the kids. But you know, not everybody has a good home life or parents they can um, you know, rely on or talk to or feel safe with. Yeah. And so if school is their really only outlet, which I think we saw in COVID, those, you know, those kids had no, no outlet, no safe space. Yeah. And if that is, you know, the kids' only resource, does the district have any plans to kind of increase mental health resources in the schools before it gets to that crisis level? Well, and I would say part of what we try to do is get to kids before, you know, one of the things that we always say as school counselors is the beauty of what we do is we're available to all kids, if we can be available, right? You don't have to have a mental health diagnosis to see me, you, you know what I mean? Um, but the challenge is exactly that. So. No, that's a great question. And so I think just for you that are here tonight, this is the start of it too, because when it comes to taking care of our kids, it's all of us taking care of our kids, you know? Um, and as parents, we're super protective. You know, there's the term mama bear for a reason and papa bear for a reason. And so our first instinct is to get into defense mode and be protective. So part of it is just having these conversations and connecting. The reason, there are lots of adults in buildings, right? So if you from, if you come into any school setting, that's the one thing you're going to see are lots of adults. And I always say, and I'll write about education. People who are in education are in education for the right reason. Right? They're here because they love kids, and they take on your kids like their own kids. They are super protective of them. They want nothing but the best for them. And it's, it's, it's a hard job. It's getting harder. I mean, I had one, and I was exhausted. So when you walk in a classroom and they have 25 or 35, it's exhausting because we care that much. And so you need to know that staff also receive mental health training. So they have annual training on what are the early warning signs of mental health. So they're trying to cue in. So they have that background. They don't have the expertise of a school counselor, right? So we, we keep those experts and we have that access. Could we use more? Yes, we could. But I'm very grateful to have, I mean, again, for, for Brainerd Public Schools to be able to say for 30 years we've had mental health counselors on top of school counselors in schools. The other thing is we have collaborative workers. You know, collaborative workers are, are a place we know have a collaborative worker at the high school, finally. Um, but they're kind of that liaison that can go between, because there's certain things that schools can do and certain things that other services can do. So trying to connect all those resources. But the answer to that is that caring adults and keeping your eyes and ears open. And students, you know, again, our kids need to know, and that was, um, he was supposed to be with us tonight, Terrence. He was uh, a gentleman that gave a message. Uh, to 7th through 12th graders, so if you have a 7th through 12th grader, ask him how it was today. Um, but his message really was we need to lift each other up and take care of each other. Um, social media is a blessing and a curse. You know, I, I think one of the things we're teaching kids and, and we need to teach ourselves as adults, everything we read on social media isn't true. Um, the hard part when it comes from a school district, so I'll tell you about myself and my role, right, is you want to be able to communicate. You want to communicate accurately. You want to communicate transparently. That takes time, right? So in a crisis situation, it's always about the immediate crisis, then it's about those that have been around the crisis, getting a hold of those guardians, then it might be about taking care of the staff. You know, there's just time. And Snapchat, cell phones, right? Um, you know, we know more about what happens on a bus before. I mean, the kids, we typically find out a kid or a parent called and just said, you know, my kid just called and the bus is stuck and so-and-so is driving it, right? <laughs> So a parents calling us before sometimes even the bus driver's been able to radio. That's just the instant access to information our kids are having. And knowing that, it's our job to kind of help them sift through it and take care of it and ask them those questions. But really, the answer to that mental health question is everybody. You know, I'm grateful for the community that leads in. I'm grateful for the volunteers that come in. I can tell you we have more information and don't ever hesitate. If something feels funny or it's an awkward feeling in your gut, and it's 9.30 at night and you're afraid to send an email or make a phone call, or if it's 11 o'clock at night, you make the phone call and you send the email. We're very grateful. I know administration respond regularly to parents like, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'm concerned. Can you check this out? Um, and I think as parents, you know, staff have responded quickly. That's how we take care of kids. Um, 
So yes, could we use 10 more counselors, 20 more counselors? Um, but we have lots of caring adults. Um, and I think parents, like you said, I think a parent pointed out here, we're parenting a lot of other kids too, right? Because we care about our kids' friends, and I think letting them know that there's people who care about them and are going to take care of them, that's the most important. So. Um, with that, we've reached for actually a little bit over time. Um, I know uh, Andrea and Rick, if you guys can help thank Rick for me, that would be great. We just felt too time wise. There's so many questions, so we hope to continue to do um, more access for our parents. So if you have suggestions of things we can do for you, please let us know as well. But thanks for being here. I know Andrea and Rick, um, our school counselors, are staying. Um, Chief Exit is here. So if, there's, if you're more comfortable asking an individual question, please do that as well. All right? Thank you.